Okay, as I want to recognize Dale Treadway, who's going down the hill to help get uh, chairs. She is one of the Master Gardener volunteers too. And she and I were fortunate enough to be some of the original uh, gardeners at this garden. It started in March seven years ago in the snow. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's when the best planning comes. We, we built, we couldn't believe it. Well, what was here, honey? the library director said, oh my gosh, will you please, she asked the horticulture agent, the extension agent, will you please get some people and y'all come up here and build a, a garden here. This used to be a school playground. Oh, that was a school. I think that school may have burned. I don't know. Something happened to that school. But anyway, now they rebuilt built the library. And she said to Tim Matthews at the time, she said, hey, we got this big flat place, total sunshine. So what more could you want for a place to have a garden other than something besides hard as a rock soil <laughs> so that got us started with the uh, raised beds but and so this is pretty much on raised beds however when you see the butterfly garden that we have over there it's not in a raised bed and y'all i couldn't believe this this is the first thing i did as a master gardener and i just knew nothing and still have tons to learn but at that time i had no idea we just brought lots and lots and lots of compost put it right on the ground, built it up, and planted right into it. And look at that garden over wow. there. When we get done talking, we'll go over there and look at the plants, and I'll talk to you about the different plants. Um, but if you don't mind, just so it won't take everybody's time, let's do questions at the end. Are y'all okay with that? Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> I can stick around for about an hour or so once we're done. So um, we can do questions then. But there's, I. The big thing for me as, what was your name? I didn't Melinda. Know. Melinda was saying how much she loves monarchs. Me too, Melinda. And I just was devastated when I first learned about their decline. You know, you look at the statistics and you say, oh my God, what is happening to the monarchs? You know, when you talk about butterflies, this is one of the most well-recognized, beautiful butterflies we have. And, you know, that's the one they stick up there all the time, and you're thinking, why do they say the monarch is the main butterfly? Because guess what? He's declining. But is it? Yes. Pardon my interruption, Marsha, but can you speak up? Can I speak up? Yes. Oh, my gosh. Over the, it's the weed eating. <clears throat> so that's the town of Canton. We, yeah. we notified the county not Please don't weed eat or uh, mow up here today. So didn't think about the town. I moved my mic up. Does that help any? Yeah, but it's to hear. Uh, they can't hear. Oh, you guys can't hear? <laughs> Annie can hear. Uh, they can't hear. <laughs> you can't hear. Maybe you better move over here. <laughs> you could. You could because I'm more on this side and you'll be away from the mower if you don't yeah. mind. Yeah. Just get in a spot where you can see. If y'all don't mind, yeah, but I do want you to be able to see, okay, uh, okay, just, uh, you know, don't you hate it when a speaker says, raise your hand if, I, if you can't hear me? God, I hate that. Okay, so, um, let's start with... Let's start with this poster right here. I imagine a lot of you guys have seen this thing before. One of the things that's so amazing about the monarch is its long, long migration pattern that it has, you know? And let's just say, okay, let's start with the monarchs down here where they overwinter. That's about mid South Central Mexico. This is in Mexico, near Michoacan. Mexico, okay? Down here, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Anyway, most of it, most of them are on the east coast. Almost all of them. There's very few now. On the west coast, there's some, but not so many. They've had a quite a decline, especially recently. But anyway, let's start right here. Wintering, adult monarchs. In about March or so, they'll leave here and come up to the Texas area and lay their eggs on milkweed. Only milkweed, that's all that the caterpillar babies can eat is milkweed, okay? That's why we gotta plant more milkweed. 
because if they don't have their baby food, what are we going to do? We're not going to have any babies. So first generation, the first one's eggs are laid in about Texas. That's called generation one. And then over time, they start creeping up, creeping up, and there, it takes about four generations to get to the northern, north central part of the country or into the lower part of Canada. About four generations, four or five at the most usually. And then the adults, of the, all of those except the last ones only live about two weeks. The last generation is the amazing generation. They come and they've never been to Mexico, okay? But what do they do? They fly all the way back down here, anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000 miles, and they go right to the very same place in those oya male trees down there near Michoacan in Mexico. Oya male. Oya male. Okay, it's a fir tree. And it's a very small area where they are. It's about half the size of a football field. Oh, wow. Isn't that crazy? And they're all right there. And they go back to the same place. Okay? So, um, let's see. When they get there, let me see if I can find the right picture. Y'all can pass that around. Mm -hmm. I've seen that. They get together in clusters. They'll fly in clusters, too. We used to have them come through here along the Pigeon River, like in hordes. You don't see that anymore. Used to see it. If you're lucky, when you go up on the parkway, you might see a few together, wow. or one straggler, one straggler. But they cluster like that. They're cold-blooded animals, so that helps. And they shingle like that for warmth. So all up in the trees. Have any of y'all seen this clustering? Yeah. Me either. Let's put it on our... Have you seen it? Well, yeah, but this was years ago, back in 89 or 90, and it was down there around uh, Southern California. California they, yeah, and there were so many of them. Yeah, there, that's what I'm talking about. And it used to be like that. There's some there now, but not so many. I've been reading about some really bad things. Now, let's think about why is there's the decline of that uh, migration. Fires. Think of the fires, the think dry. of the droughts, yeah. think of the temperature, all that climate change. Now, as far as them going north, it could be that because it's warm, they keep on going north. And by the time they start to come back, there's not enough fuel for them to get back on because it's late. It's about November or so when they're coming back. And I don't have stands of milkweed and um, iron weed and joe pie weed growing in November, it's gone, you know. But they've got to have a whole bunch of food. When they're babies, when they are um, larvae, caterpillars, these first three generations, they'll put about 20 grams of fat into their body, okay. But this last bunch, then they've studied this, 125 grams of fat. Wow. Now they need all that fat for several reasons. One is they got a long way to fly. Think about this, they're about the size of, and weight of a paper clip. And they gotta go 3,000 miles. Of course, they're pretty smart little paper clips because you know, they ride. It's really cool when you see them riding on an airstream, you know, oh, yeah. they take advantage of that. But um, they've got a long ways to go. Like I said, some of them are going 3,000 miles for so their flight. And another thing I hadn't reminded you of yet is that they don't make any babies before they get to Mexico. In fact, they don't make babies in Mexico. They wait until they're back in Texas. What does that tell you about Texas? Anyhow, <laughs> that is called diapause because they pause their reproductive cycle. Okay, that's diapause, that's what they do. But, so, they've got to have um, fuel to fly, they've got to have fuel to live through the diapause, keep themselves fed. There's not a whole lot of nectar and food down there in Mexico for them in those high, high trees, okay, in the, in the high mountains. 
Um, and then they still, you know, all that body fat helps them make it back to Texas, and then they reproduce. So that takes a whole lot of energy. Okay, so we need not only to provide them milkweed, which is their baby food, also nectar plants. They come through here, not a whole lot of them come through North Carolina, but some of them do. Most of them go through the Corn Belt in the middle part of the country. But, and some do come over here, but most of them right here. So, <clears throat> anyway, they come through here going north, and then the last generation comes back through. So that means we need plants in that station over there for them that are blooming really early. Gosh, I saw the first two monarchs out there on April 15th this year. That's pretty early. They're not usually that early. That's a date we can remember, right? Yeah. April 15th. So um, we need things that are blooming early and we need things that are blooming late on into October. So you need to really think about your plants when you're putting them out there to feed them all the way through. Are you going to be suggesting to us which plants those are? I am. And you got a big old couple of lists in there. Oh, good. So don't worry about that. You got the list. Okay. This is a picture, just real quick, of their life cycle. And Dale, my buddy Dale, after we get done, y'all can come by and look at this. Um, this is pretty, pretty close to life size of their life cycle. And the egg is like teeny, like a pinhead, you know? And... Here we go, five different, what they call instars, where the caterpillar will, his, his outer skin just breaks open. And then the bigger caterpillar is there. But when he finally gets here to the, what they call the fifth instar, by day 18, he'll attach himself with a little silken patch and hang from something. He has to hang, makes a little J. And you can make yourself cross-eyed watching all that. It's an awesome thing to see. I mean, really, it's fun to watch. But eventually, he'll start wiggling and wriggling and going around and around and spinning around. And this skin will break open. And this is the crazy thing. You're not seeing him make a chrysalis. The chrysalis is in there. He just broke the skin off. I don't know, Melinda. We don't know. Anyway, there is the chrysalis, and it'll be like that for, I'm thinking it's like 10 days or something like that. Then it'll start, you'll look at that thing one day, and it'll be kind of vibrating. And the outer edge looks kind of clear, and you look, and he's looking kind of dark, and all of a sudden you see his wings, you can see orange, and that awesome? And eventually he comes out, and he comes out, head first, here he comes out, and then he just hangs on to that um, covering. He just hangs there and lets his wings dry. And you're thinking, oh my God, there's something wrong with my butterfly. What in the world? He just has to hang and dry, and then eventually he can work his wings. But he comes out looking crumpled up, and you think, what a mess. But he's, hopefully he's going to be okay. And then he may not fly off for like 24 hours or something like that. He's not quite ready, okay? So not to panic. Okay, so now, let's see. Um, I wanted to talk just a little bit about why, why we've had this decrease. We talked about the decrease well, we hadn't really, we talked about global warming and the weather, you know, fires and drought and floods and everything else. Think about this, when there's a tornado or a hurricane or something like that, and that little paper clip's trying to, they'll, they'll get in the trees and um, try to protect themselves. That's one thing you might see them do is shelter in there. But a big thing is their habitat loss. What are we growing out there in the Corn Belt which is their big place, their biggest breeding ground, the genetically modified organisms, right? So these herbicides that don't kill the corn or don't kill the soy, that's what we're using now. So we're feeding people instead of butterflies. 
that's what we're doing. I mean, you know, that's a big part of the habitat loss. In fact, they say, let's see, what was the percent? Yeah, over 60% of the milkweed has been eliminated from this area. That's over half their food, okay? And the entire native flora eliminated where most of the monarch breeding is going on. So think about this, y'all. I've been to a few classes here lately where they really emphasize that the native, one reason the native plants were so important is that that's what the insects are used to. They've kind of adapted together so that, you know, the insects help and pollinate the plants and they're used to the plant structure. They can do pollination to help the plants. But the plants are so important for their food. They can't eat just anything, you know. Okay, now, what about in Mexico? They got to have those trees. And there's a lot of illegal logging going on. We got poor folks that are trying to eke out a living as farmers. And guess what? Avocado farmers. That's a big that's a big thing in that location. So um, a loss of habitat down there is a big problem for them. That's part of it too. Okay, so what are we going to do? Enter in da -da -da -da. Chip Taylor, who is a professor at the University of Kansas, which is in the Corn Belt, came up with this idea about establishing what he called monarch way stations. You know, the rest stops that we like to stop at, this is like a rest stop for the monarchs, okay? And he called it monarch waste stations. Trying so hard to get thousands and thousands of these established globally, you know, but especially <clears throat> in the United States where we have this going on. So the purpose of this is, and it says right on the sign, it provides milkweeds, nectar sources and shelter to sustain monarch butterflies as they migrate through North America. And this garden is certified and registered with Monarch Watch as a certified monarch way station. One of the handouts that you're going to receive today is information about how you can do this very same thing. And it's, it's way easier than you think it is. I mean, it really is easier than you think it is. Um, you have to have, you, you need at least 10 milkweed plants. And the best thing is to have more than one kind of milkweed. There's hundreds of different kinds of milkweed, but there's only three that are appropriate right here in Haywood County, okay? One, one thing that you wanna do is make sure that along with the milkweed, you have some nectar plants. So on your list of the plants that we're going to be giving you, um, it, it, it includes the proper uh, milkweed, which is the common milkweed, the swamp milkweed, and the butterfly weed. Okay? No tropical milkweed. If you tell me you went to, I guess I won't name that nursery, but a popular nursery in Haywood County, and you bought a tropical milkweed, get rid of it because tropical milkweed will do, and I'll show you what it looks like. The tropical milkweed itself does not kill the butterfly, but guess what it does do? They love it, it's like candy to them. Y'all ever seen this? The thing about this, they think it's candy. Basically it's, and it lives a long time. It lives too long, it lives into November or whatever. So let's say there's some of that sitting around growing really well in your yard in November and the monarchs are coming along, coming along, they stop. Oh, I can just stay here. And they don't keep going to Mexico. So when that happens, they have a greatly increased risk of getting a disease. I wonder if I can say it. O-E. Um, Electroscura, what's the first part? O -E. Anyway, it's called O.E. Um, parasites, it's parasites. And the thing is, and I think I've seen this too, it can make the butterfly be deformed if they get those parasites. It can mess up their wings. 
so they can't fly. And if the mama gets it on her wings, she's going to spread it all over to the other uh, milkweeds. So, mm -mm. And when you go to nurseries and you see them selling tropical milkweed, please say to them, as your customer, I'd appreciate if you didn't do that. That should be, I mean, that shouldn't be anywhere in North America. That's what the literature says. Not in Canada, not in North America. This is not the tropics. Okay, getting off of that. <laughs> That's my beef. Here's my other beef. This guy right here, this thing is called the tussock moth caterpillar. Let me put it up here. Can you guys see that? Okay, anybody ever seen this? Quite colorful, isn't he? Isn't he beautiful? He's actually colors of monarch. Well, he's not the friend of the monarch. What he'll do is get on your milkweed plant and strip it in about an hour. Milkweed food's gone. Oh well. So, here's what I do with them. And my, my agent, I asked him if I could say this because he's an entomologist and he loves insects. I said, I'm going to say this. He said, okay, that's what you just got to say. This is just dishwater. Pull them off, throw them in there. It'll kill them. Don't use pesticides in your monarch waste station. Don't do it. If it's a herbicide, a pesticide, who's it going to kill? All of the bugs, that's right, it's going to kill all the insects. And that's not what we want to do. So if you see something questionable, this is a good way to get rid of them. How big are they? How big do those get? Are they like our caterpillar? Are they monarch size? More or less. This is a little bigger than most of the monarchs. Yeah. You know, huh. monarch caterpillars. But about the same size. So big bug. Yep. But like I say, when we're done, y'all are welcome to look at this wonderful display that Dale brought. I think this is great. It shows the chrysalis. It shows the whole thing. Uh, it's really nice. Is that an invasive species, or is it, is it native? Tussock moth? Yeah. It may be native. I, I, I don't, haven't heard said that it came from anywhere else. It, it makes a moth is what it becomes. But it sure will eat up your milkweed so I pinch them right off okay. um you can pin. you can shake shake them off onto the ground or whatever did I say we were doing questions at the end I did I'm sorry, oh, I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry because I'll never get you out of here and you'll be like ah oh, that lady talks too long I'm sorry okay so number one rule about your waste station no pesticides okay that's number one Number two, you want a bunch, of, a lot of sunlight. We got plenty of sunlight out here, six to eight hours. Now here's the thing, maybe, every, maybe your whole place is shady. That doesn't mean you can't plant something and it do some good, but it does mean those plants, <clears throat> excuse me, may not have as much nectar. Plants have more nectar if they get more sunshine. They also have more nectar when they're young. Go figure. So, deadheading is a good thing. Not only does it make your garden look pretty, but the next flowers coming in are going to have more nectar. Okay? So, um, yeah. Now, shelter is another thing. Oh, oh, I was going to say another thing about sunlight. As I said, the butterflies are cold-blooded animals. And you don't really see them in the mornings early that much. But when they come out, they're trying to warm up. And they might spread their wings. They'll get on a, something like a rock or a statue, something you might have in your garden. And just that's when you see them opening their wings and they're warming up. Okay, so that's a good thing. A basking rock is a good thing to have in your garden. Um, shelter. You might have some shrubs nearby or trees, although you don't want, you know, a bunch of shade on there, but something to kind of shelter. But another thing that you can shelter, and this is one of the things they say in the waste station recommend, recommendations, to have anywhere from two to ten plants per square yard. Well, square yard, that's, you know, but some of those plants, they're going to get big. They're going to get big. You'll see how big. Um, and also, as far as your number of plants, 
I think I said already, 10 milkweeds is good. Two to three nectar plants per milkweed. That's a really good place to have lunch for monarchs, okay? So, but it doesn't have to be big. Like if you've got 10 feet by 10 feet, that's a nice size little butterfly garden. It doesn't have to be 400 square feet like that one over there. <laughs> Maybe you're thinking, God, I don't have anywhere to plant this stuff. Well, add some milkweed to what you already have. Milkweed is the most important thing. The, the nectar plants, they're probably more likely to find than milkweed. It's more scarce. Although the best thing you can do is do both. Okay? But, because people aren't planting milkweed that much. Now, common milkweed in particular likes to take over. Y'all may know that story. Well, guess what? You can go ahead and plant it where you want it. If it gets way over yonder, if you don't want it there, you can mow it down. Now, I'm not going to say it's not going to come back. It's very persistent. But that's okay. Give it, some give it the space you can. Just give it a chance. And that uh, butterfly weed you have, it doesn't spread so much like that. It'll make a nice bush. You'll see we got a couple of nice bushes. In fact, there's one right over there. See that orange thing? Yep, that's that's a butterfly bush. Yep. Okay. Um, what about water? They do need some water. They'll, if you just put a bucket or something out there with water in it, they can't drink from that. They're going to drown in it. They got to have a place to perch. And so Jennifer got us a little bird bath over there, put some sand in it. You can put um, some rocks for them to perch on, some little pebbles or whatever. And then they'll take that little proboscis of theirs, just have the sand wet. They can go right in there and suck up some water, but they have to have a place to perch. Okay. Uh, one of our handouts talks about mosquitoes. You don't want to leave standing water. That's something you don't want to do. Like in, I think it's a half a cup of water, you can breed a thousand mosquitoes or something in just a day or two. So, you know, be careful with that. But they do need some water. Um, um, and you see, have y'all ever seen monarchs or any butterflies doing what they call puddling, where they get in a whole bunch of them in the sand? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, they are getting for themselves um, minerals that they need. They need salts and they need minerals. And I oh, already took that picture down. Well, here it is. The way you recognize the male <clears throat> is he has these little black dots. That's where he makes his manly hormone, his manly stuff, you know. And he can he has to have those salts and minerals to produce that. And he can pass on to the female what she needs. So um, that's just a point I thought was kind of interesting. You'll see them sitting on a cow patty, and you'll think, what in the world is a butterfly doing on a cow patty? That is nasty and gross. They're getting minerals they need. It's important that they do that. Okay, so <clears throat> let's make a comment or two about native plants. I already beat the uh, tropical down in the ground. Now this is a sign up there at Shining Rock. There's the top of it. Look at that goldenrod. That's native. When we buy our plants, let's don't go get those little hybrids that are going to be teeny tiny. These guys that are the real deal, they're going to have more nectar and a better quality of nectar. Now check this one out. This is a Joe Pye weed. I think that, th well, how tall am I? About five feet, a little over five feet. That's at least 10 feet tall. We have some of that over there. You'll see, it's looking pretty good. And um, we have another one called Ironweed. It looks pretty good too. Okay, now I wanna show you something about when you're planting I don't want to know what color stuff to plant. Well, butterflies like, are drawn to, like red, orange, yellow, pink, purple. Here's what you see when you're looking at a yellow coneflower. Here is what they see. How the heck did they figure that out? That's what I want. 
there there's pixels it's the pixels in their eyes i you know i don't know the scientific stuff about it but i just think that is fascinating vanna could you help me put these up please it's it's interesting the pattern that they see and we don't know if the pattern kind of shows them where to go or if it helps them find their favorite color or what did i lose it here it is there it is thank you thank you so much no we're gonna put that one up there you go thank you there you go so is it that these this pattern draws them towards the nectar or is it just that color helps them recognize there's nectar there anyhow one of the things you can do when you plant things is put big swaths of color together like about three feet wide is good for a planting now i'm going to give you all some plants today and they're going to be about that big some of them well give them leave some room for them so they can grow remember the butterfly we'd make a bush but you want it to be where you can similar color so they can see it and you want it close like i said two to ten plants depending on how big it's going to get in a square yard so they're not wasting a bunch of energy flying from here to over there to over there you know right in here they can go from plant to plant you've seen them do it i know you have and that way they don't use their energy to fuel up okay that is one that they like it sure is and the cool thing about planting purple coneflower is it multiplies you'll have more you plant one you're gonna have some more and you can share them with a neighbor after you get more than you know what to do with but that's a really nice it's really nice now this flower look how it's kind of flat and that gives the butterfly a place to kind of perch like a landing pad sort of thing marigolds i mean y'all might can imagine this would be an example of how you can buy some that are kind of pom-pom and then you can buy like some of those Frenchy ones that are kind of shaped like this and then they also have ones that are flat the flat one is the one that works best that they can get the nectar from the easiest and that's one reason I like zinnias because they are flat like that so cosmos think of the flat flower that's a good one for them although you know some of these others are not flat but still they get in there now I just want to show you this to help you think about how important it is for all the pollinators not just the monarch not just the butterflies but all the pollinators they're the ones that make our food you know make it make us able to eat to a great amount of our food it's important that here's what <clears throat> flying milkweed seeds look like so this is why they spread that helps them spread around i will pass that around so you can see some i think that one's a butterfly weed but the seeds look similar for common milkweed too i'm not sure which one that is to you, so anyway so here's the summary for your waste station know what pesticides. no pesticides no poison plenty of sunshine and shelter some shelter water and native plants okay before you plant anybody know what this is yes if you'll take a sample of your soil you can find out from the extension office how to do it and at certain times of year it's free at other times of the year when everybody else is doing it it's not free they'll cost what four dollars i think i believe at um about thanksgiving a little before thanksgiving they start charging or no that's when it's free okay yeah. um so i just want to encourage every one of you guys to do this whether you certify yourself or not but if you do the certification if you put the sign up other people are going to see it and they're going to say what is that what has my crazy neighbor done now you know and get curious about it and maybe they also will help save the monarchs and all the pollinators 
So thank you guys for your attention. I do want to tell you <clears throat> that in the library, there's a book on square foot gardening by Mel Bartholomew. Really good stuff, good stuff to read. You can learn a lot about taking care of plants and how to do this kind of stuff. So we're gonna, um, as soon as we get done with any questions you might have, we're gonna go over there and look at the way station. And after that, we can look at whatever you wanna look at in the garden. Okay, I think that's my story. <laughs>